Well, good evening. Uh, welcome to my CP webinar series, where we uh, typically present uh, uh, work that's going on in our in our research from the investigators to the community. Uh, but we're doing a little change up today, where we are presenting our platform for getting research from the community um, to anyone that is interested. So both community members and uh, clinician researchers. Uh, my name is Paul Gross. I'm the CEO and president of the Cerebral Palsy Research Network, and I am also the main speaker for this evening talking about making a difference uh, with MyCP and, and how you can do that. Uh, I'm going to start by uh, running a little poll. If I can remember how to do this in Zoom. Um, so I'm going to start that, and I'm going to let you uh, work your way through the answers. Um, are people getting the poll? Yeah, looks like they are. Which of the following best described? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Can you read them now? Okay, I'm going to end the poll and see if I can share the results. There are people seeing the results. I need a nod because I muted everybody. Yeah, okay, thanks, John. Um, all right, so 75% of us are adults with CP, one is a caregiver. Uh, there is, there's no one who it's, who it's their first MyCP webinar, which is going to shorten the presentation. Um, are you already a member? Everyone is. And what have you participated in? Um, a lot of it. Wow. Okay. This may officially be the choir. So um, I am going to close that and uh, move on. So given that all of you have been to my CP webinars, I'm going to skip uh, the overview of CPRN, although I am going to share uh, one slide in particular that is new, so you're familiar with our mission, uh, our accomplishments over the last seven or eight years. We are now up to uh, 1,800 people uh, that are uh, part of my CP from the community, <clears throat> and we are also uh, up to nine publications, which is exciting and uh, new, and several manuscripts under uh, being developed currently. Uh, so I'm just going to refresh people on this because this relates to the, the presentation. So we have two registries. We have a clinical registry, i.e. a registry that is a database of information that gets gathered through usual care when a person comes into uh, the hospital either for an event um, or comes in for an annual uh, visit, uh, an event being you know, some kind of acute uh, pain or, or accident of some sort or for a, uh, an intervention. Um, or just that annual visit. Um, so those are the clinical registry. And then the community registry are things that you've all participated in, or many of you have participated in, which are the surveys that you can find on MyCP. So I've got two data points from each of the two registries, and they're, uh, they're important to understand. So gross motor function classification system is that five-point scale that's uh, used to assess how you move around through the community. So one through three are ambulators, four and five are wheelchair users, uh, and then within four and five, there's uh, different, different degrees of sort of trunk and head control. So looking at the clinical registry, um, this is back from November data of 2021, we had about 5,000 patients in the registry. Um, and for June Kales' sake, I'm going to say we call them patients in this scenario because they are in the hospital. Um, and you see a U-shaped curve. And if you were to go and look at the CDC uh, research, which is a population-based surveillance, you'd see a slightly different shape of curve in terms of how um, ambulatory status is represented uh, in the community um, in a way that represents the population. Our clinical registry is biased towards people that come to the hospital. And so that's important to understand. 
um, but it's also intended to be an enabler of research uh, where what we're trying to do is research in that setting, the, the things that happen as a function of uh, growing up with CP and the interventions and the outcomes. On the right-hand side, we have age and we just bucketed it into some age bands. And you see that we've got a little over 20% in the clinical registry are adults uh, at this stage. Um, and I do need to break that 11 to 18 band at some point into up to 17.99 so that we can actually see the percentage of adults. So then in the community registry, which is all based on the sampling of data that we get from people participating uh, in MyCP, you see A, smaller numbers. This was back in February and we had 1,669 members of the community that were part of uh, MyCP. And you see a very different distribution of GMFCS or gross motor function classification system. And this is also not representative of the population. It's representative of the people that spend time online, um, interested in advancing research, being public with their, or directing their data in a way that can advance care and generate new discovery. So you see a, a different representation than uh, you'd find in the population. And you also see a very different view in terms of the age distribution versus the clinical registry. And that once again is I think reflective of even the, the crowd that we have on this call, a lot of interest um, from adults in seeing uh, research advance uh, for cerebral palsy. Uh, I am going to hey, leave the Paul, chat. This June, what, why do you stop at over 36 bottom uh, right? I stop at over 36 because the graph in the upper right was done by statisticians and for reasons that I can't explain. Um, and so that's why we have like we can look at a scatter plot of age and get a different view that wouldn't be percentages, but would give you kind of gestalt. Um, and that would not use any specific uh, you know, um, age band. So there's no real good reason. And then I just replicated it in the lower graph just to be able to compare apples to apples. Do you have a thought about what you'd like to see? Or yeah, yeah, I do. And the reason I comment at this June Kales is that I get so many questions, you know, over many decades, like how long do people with CP actually live? So I think that, you know, you're, whatever you have in this survey group is certainly going to go much longer than 36. And people really are interested in that for many reasons. But I yeah, always hear that question. You know. Great, great point. Then Who's we the with... oldest person you know with CP? I get that one too. <laughs> um, I, I, the oldest person I know with CP is on this, on this uh, Zoom call. Um, <laughs> but I will not call them out by, by name. But uh, I'm 56. We're good. Uh, okay. So those are the two registries. And we're going to be talking uh, quite a bit more tonight about the community registry because that is the one that um, is part of my CP. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to talk about, about our programs because you know that I am going to do this slide because it's changing. Um, and I, we also have a new thing that we've been representing, which we think is interesting. So the green pins are the sites that are actively collecting data. Um, the yellow pins are sites that are working on the data collection. Uh, the red pins are working on just some of the regulatory uh, agreement pieces. And the blue pins are all sites that have said, we want to join. It's a matter of finding money or getting other disciplines that treat CP to agree. Um, but a, a real uh, increasing interest in uh, the work of the network. But this is the new slide that uh, Gary Noritz uh, had me develop for our uh, AACPDM uh, special interest group uh, meeting um, last month. So this shows you which of our sites actually are doing lifespan care. Um, so this uh, really will mean as we bring more of these sites uh, online and shifting data to us, we're gonna be able to see um, a lot more sort of natural history data about uh, the adults um, that are out there. So uh, 
we're doing lots of research. This is the, the pipeline. Um, you know that. And now I'm going to shift gears to talk about making a difference with my CP. So this is kind of my outline of the areas I intend to talk about. So it really is intended to bring together the extended community for several reasons. One is to be able to provide personalized information uh, to you and reading recommendations from our site and from off of our site. Um, to really set research priorities, uh, nothing about you without you is a, a very important and popular phrase that we believe in deeply. And to discuss your lived experience because that really helps us understand um, Duncan Wyeth, who's on this call, participates in one of our quality improvement efforts. And I can't tell you how impactful it is for the clinicians to be talking about how they're dealing with something like about pain uh, or functional level. And for Duncan to be able to talk about what, what it's like for him. And it really shifts the, uh, the response of the clinicians involved and sort of changes the work, which is really, it's really quite magical, but it's also the way it should be. And we feel uh, good to be able to do this. Thirdly is to understand the evidence behind treatment options. Um, fourth is to contribute your personal data, i.e. in the form of participating in surveys to improve outcomes for everyone, uh, improve knowledge uh, about uh, people with CP. And then lastly, it provides a place to participate in a, just a marvelous uh, well-being program uh, called Mentor. So these are gonna be my themes that I'm gonna talk through. Um, but that's all very highfalutin. So I want to just start with, well, what is it really? Go back so, a page. I was taking a picture. Pardon this, me. I was taking a picture of that. Is this going to be available online? Yes, this will be available online. Always okay. recorded and I, I will share it. So you can snap pics of the recording easily if, um, or stop me if you need to. Okay. So what is it really? It's a secure private it's a set of secure and private web services, uh, which can be websites or websites talking to websites uh, inside of CPRN.org, uh, our main website, that's accessed via a free membership. Um, and so a little more detail of what those services are. Well, there's control over notifications for all things that CPRN posts on its website, its blog in particular. It's a recommendation engine uh, based on the information you provide when you sign up. Um, it's a private discussion forum. And it's a set of one-time and annual surveys for research uh, for specifically adults with CP or parents of minors with CP. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a bit. And then it's access to our mentor well-being uh, program where we're partnered with the National Center for Health uh, physical activity and disability. So in terms of when I say this is embedded in CPRN, when you go to our website, you've got these, what we call our billboard menus, which are you know general information about cere cerebral palsy or information about uh, adults specifically. Uh, and then the next two areas are really focused on the um, people interested in research. And then there's one for clinicians and researchers. Those are very general and they're open to everyone. But this green bar across the top when you're not logged in says, join my CP. Or if you're logged in, this is a, a dummy account that I have for demo purposes. And you see it's got a just an ID that was automatically generated and tells you nothing about uh, the person who created it. But that drop down menu, this is essentially this connection of web services. Some of these are hosted right on CPRN. Some of these talk to uh, or bring up another, another browser window. Um, but these, these are the way we tie together the services that make up uh, my CP. So why is that important? Why is what we're doing here important? Well, first of all, it creates a really unique opportunity to involve the community in research. And there's just been a ton of research that's been produced that patient-centered, um, or I've been trying to say since um, June, you and I had that talk a long time ago, community-centered research 
uh, is really the, the best research that it shows that when you're when the researchers are working on things that the community values with the community, there's the best outcomes, the best uptake of that evidence that gets generated. So that's really fundamentally important to be able to have the community come together to discuss priorities and directions uh, and really make it feel like it is an extended community working towards improving uh, everyone's outcomes and well-being. Uh, it, is, it is a place where there's availability of diversity, of equity, and inclusion with the limitation of it's anyone with internet access, but it is, it is free, it works on the phone, it works on a web browser. Um, so with the exception of the fact that there are um, people that don't have internet access or um, that, that it is pretty open to everyone in that regard. Uh, it is a place that we are using to find people that are interested in co-production. And co-production is a little bit of a buzzword, but it really means making you as a community member an equal to the clinician or researcher or clinician researcher that is that's doing the work. And um, you know, I'll come back to this example of Duncan, but we have we have other examples, but uh Duncan is really our uh, most shining and most active uh, member where um, I, I don't think people ever think about like everything gets checked in with Duncan or Duncan raises ideas that become uh, very important to the direction that we're moving where we're trying to improve the care of adults um, right now focused on pain and eventually on, on function, which is clearly very interrelated. Um, so getting to that point where people feel like they can be working side by side and there, there's this mutual respect is really what came out of sort of research CP that we did in um, 2017 and published in 2018. And I'm gonna talk about that a bit more. Uh, and it was really one of the most powerful things about that meeting and about the kind of processes we run is we have we provide a place for people to come together and be treated as, uh, as equals. Uh, and then lastly, it's a place for us to give back to the community um, for their involvement and so for your involvement. So it's both the education about the kinds of treatments, uh, about the evidence um, for those things, and it's uh, the give back of being able to help set the direction for you know, where this research engine gets pointed. Um, and then it's also you know, targeted information uh, to help you with your journey. And there's a lot more to generate here, but uh, I like to refer to Google as flat. You, you Google, and even if you get your search terms well, you get a set of things that rank and show up on that page for reasons that don't necessarily pertain to you. It pertains to the way that content is written or, um, but it, it really knows nothing about you. And so what my CP is intended to do is allow you to zoom in on the wealth of information that we have that is about you. Um, and so that is really one of the key things. And that content that you're zooming in on is created by experts and it's curated by community leaders like uh, Michelle, who I do believe I saw is on the call and created the CP toolkit, worked very, very closely with many leaders in the field to say, like, here's the information that we think is important to present, um, but to present it in lay language and then making sure that it's factually accurate is really um, an important part of what we do. Uh, so now I'm going to dive into, um, now that I've defined the why, I'm going to dive into how you can get these, these benefits to serve you best. Um, so when I talk about notifications, that's the, the little email that you get. You may get a full description of a, of a blog post where we describe news and, uh, you know, CP stories and study uh, accomplishments and, you know, webinars that are upcoming. Uh, those things generate email to everyone that's a member of my CP by default. So posts go to everyone. Um, but each post is actually tagged with multiple categories that characterize the content. And so 
you can really turn down the knob because the knob is on like 11 for, uh, for, for most of you. You can turn it down and really make it targeted what's, what's interesting to you. And so if you're only interested in, in news or information that's coming across our site that's focused on adults, you can select that and not select uh, children and families, and you won't get, you know, probably you know, a third of our of our posts. Um, you can zoom in on research, and you know, we focus on things that are community driven, things that are specifically our studies, uh, things that are specifically about the registry, uh, and you can decide, you know, you want all or none, um, and really dial that in. Hair improvement, which is our quality improvement effort. It's, this is, again, this example that Duncan is participating in for, uh, for adult assessment of adult pain right now is what it's focused on. Uh, care improvement is how we're trying to, in real time, change the way people are cared for at centers across the network, and then generate uh, information and evidence that can change care um, you know, globally. Uh, and so you can, you know, we sometimes do post specifically about our accomplishments and that and what we found. And if you're just interested in care improvement, you can check that box. Well-being for our programs there. And then we tag every post with latest. And so that's like, if you, if you say you want latest, that's the same as you can't turn anything off because these are, these are or statements. You know, it's latest or audience um controls if you select latest you're going to get everything some things are specifically news and very rarely do we tag things with must see but we really just think those are the most important things for people to see so if you want to turn the uh turn the volume down to to one must see would be your category and so this is quite literally if we went back to that menu i showed you and you went to notifications you land on a page where this is a a bit of the page and you can select if you're getting the full blog post, or are you just getting an excerpt to decide whether or not you want to click on it? And then you have all of these categories uh, that you can select or unselect uh, to, um, to sort of choose the information that flows to you. Let me pause there. Um, a lot of information so far. Anybody have any question about uh, anything that I've said so far? Alrighty. Hey Paul, this is Jenna. I was um I was wondering, um it's been a while since you tagged us to recruit new people. Have you thought any more about um any new incentive ways to do that for the community? Um I have and I can um I can talk about that. Um let's Will you do me a favor, June, and bring that up when we get to the Q&A? Um, I think that that's an important thing, and we are trying a couple of different things, and I would love to hear, get the benefit of your all of your thoughts as to how we could do better on that. Sure thing. Yeah, okay. I have a couple of questions, too, but I don't know that they're appropriate for right this moment. Okay. And I did put something in the chat. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, I'm generally focused on the slides, and I've... Um, I am um, yeah, glancing was, at the chat when we pause, so. It was just simple, like how do, uh, if, if I had something I wanted to share with Duncan, for instance, regarding pain, if we wanted to talk with one another on a subject, would that go in your, um, what did you have, um, an online, I saw it earlier. Or um, there's a discussion forum, and I'm gonna actually, show that i don't know that i'll demonstrate that but i will show some of the capabilities of that and you you can do that although i do believe there's a trust level that you have to have interacted a fair amount before you're able to direct message people and we just we use that sort of built-in trust mechanism to make sure that people aren't you know sending people inappropriate mail if you ever want to connect like I'm always willing to connect people and I'll always take the mail from one person, send to a, a question to the other person and then connect them. You know, many clinicians are willing to make a direct connection, but like I always ask them because of their time. And so I am willing to broker anything, but in general, that's something that my CP can be used for. Perfect. 
Okay. So moving along from notifications. Um, so how do you get personalized information? So one of the other things that was on that green pull down was the recommendations page. And so it generates recommended reading based off of the information you sign, you fill in when you sign up. And so you give us not a ton of information, but enough information that we can sort of zoom in on some of what would be important from our content. And we try to update this. Um, this is not as dynamic as I'd like it to be, but it still provides some valuable information. Um, and you could all help me by, um, when you feel like there's a piece of information you found that you didn't get from the recommendation engine, um, you could you know, let me know and we'd be able to update that. So it recommends pages, books from our uh, book reviews or our, our you know, set of book resources, videos and webinars. And it does that based on really your, your movement disorder, which is your cerebral palsy type when you, you signed up, your age, uh, your gross motor function classification system level, um, and then your role. So we make recommendations that are different based on whether or not uh, you're an adult uh, or if you're a parent or a caregiver. Um, so those characteristics you, you, you see here are, if you were to go to your profile, which was again, one of those drop downs in the MyCP area, you would see what you filled in. So your CP distribution, which i.e. which limbs are involved, what your primary CP diagnosis is, and then what your gross motor function is, and, um, and your age is, is filled in as, as well. Uh, and we can make other recommendations from the other data we have when we have appropriate things to match, but those are, those are the ones that we use as our core for the matching uh, work. So let me show you uh, right now an example page. Um, so I'm going to share. Actually, that's not what I wanted to share. I'm going to share my, if I share my desktop, I will probably be in much better shape. Um, so let me go from this to, okay. So here you are, this is the example one that I was giving you and I'm gonna to go to the recommendations. And again, this is a, this is a, a pseudo character within my CP. And what you can see is it gives some basic information that says the relationship is the parent. Uh, the child's GMFCS is a GMFCS4. Um, their muscle tone or movement disorder is mixed, uh, which is most commonly meaning it's uh, spas spasticity and dystonia. It's the most common mixed um, type. And then what's the distribution? Uh, and then the current age and the date of birth of the person. So the first thing we do is recommend a set of pages that we think are absolutely critical for the community. And so there's no, there's no intelligence behind this. This is just like understanding the importance of GMFCS and what you should know about it. Um, hips and how they're affected in cerebral palsy is just a very important topic. And then uh, the all important uh, physical activity and exercise to sort of maintain um, uh, as much mobility and um, movement as, as possible. And then we make recommendations based on the profile. So, you know, knowing that, you know, someone is a GMFCS4, they're, they're a wheelchair user, they're, um, so traveling can be challenging. Um, knowing that there are, you know, our, our resources about solutions for bathing, um, the two most common types of mixed, um, the information based on those, um, educational considerations based on the age, um, and then toiling considerations based on uh, those details. And we go on to look at our, our webinars and recommend specific webinars that might be meaningful um, to you. You can see Paul in the upper right-hand corner in all of his t-shirts versus our, our docs in their lab coats and, and suits and ties. Uh, and then we go on to recommend books from uh, the books in our uh, resources section. 
uh, that based on your role, the age of the, the child and the, the sort of complexity, uh, resources that we think would be um, very useful to consume. Um, so it's really trying to make it so that based on the information you're providing us, we're able to provide you with, um, uh, with guidance from the work in our website. Okay, I'm going to go back to my slides and I am, hold on one moment. shot of my bruised arm from my baking of my uh um my recent bike riding trip okay so let me move on from there uh so setting research priorities these start with dialogues and we and we kind of pull people from my cp uh, a number of you that are on this call participated in the first of these that we did it was called research cp um it was about a Three month program where we ran through a set of uh, webinars to sort of educate everybody about terms and the definition of research and quality of improvement and registries. And then we generated uh, uncertainties, you know, uh, for research ideas or care and treatment ideas. And then we voted on them in a way that did a prioritization. And so this is just from the publication that came out in 2018 in Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology, this is just the top five um, of the items that were discovered. And like um, effects of aging were like, uh, and ways to improve outcomes were, you know, very highly uh, rated. Uh, and then all the interventions that people go through is another top um, area. Um, so this was really very community driven. Um, when we got together in Chicago, after we had had, you know, up, upwards of uh, 200 people getting educated and voting on things, we got together with 45 people and it was um, really split evenly between uh, clinicians and members of the community. Um, and the members of the community were split pretty evenly between uh, adults and parents. It was really a very powerful uh, event and it really guides what we do. So your work in, in my CP and collaborating with us helps set the direction for research that gets done. We've done another one of these and we anticipate doing um, a third and fourth one in the coming years. Uh, this one, we did a webinar on that was done by Laura Gilbert. Uh, this, was, um, this was Research CP Dystonia edition. And um, in the um, sort of interest of being as much like uh, was it Johnny Carson that did top 10 or Dave Letterman? But whoever did top 10, um, I'm assuming there's someone on this call that knows the answer to that. Uh, but anyway, uh, we did top 10 research themes for dystonia and CP. And one of the things in this table, and again, this is just the top three, uh, we have the source. So who actually proposed this thing that got voted? And so the top, the top idea was... Um, submitted by a community member. And you can see of these, you know, these first six community members were three out of six of them. So this is just another critical aspect of what being involved in MyCP gives you an opportunity to participate in that can make a difference in the research that gets conducted uh, and the way it gets conducted in a meaningful way. Thank you, June. Letterman was the top 10. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, another thing that we've talked about is, oh, got ahead of myself, is the ability to discuss uh, lived experiences in the MyCP forum. So I want to say some things about this. This is not always uh, fully clear to everyone. MyCP is private, and that means it is behind a wall that Google cannot get to. So the conversations that happen there can be at multiple levels of of security and privacy. We have groups that uh, can have discussions that are not open to everyone. Uh, and we organize those based on request. Um, but mostly everybody can see all of the discussions if you're a member. So it's not indexed by Google. It's not accessible to anyone that's not a member. Um, the content is all user generated. We're not, I mean, we do, we do feed our posts to uh, 
uh, to MyCP, um, but that's just to give us a place. We don't allow discussions on our website, so it gives us a place to discuss our posts. Um, and then it's moderated by uh, you know Michelle and me and many of you that have just been involved for a long time. I mean, many of the people on this call are our most active members. But it's also extended community. It's not just people with CP or caregivers. And so one of the things you can look at when you are um, you know, looking at anybody's post is you can see by these little, they're called flares and they go by their name or their ID. And it's, are they a member of the community? Are they a clinician researcher? Are they an advocate or are they from industry? Um, and we require that when people sign up, first choice is that you're anonymous. But if you want, you can use a nickname or you can use your name, totally up to you. Um, but for these other categories, it's required that they disclose their full name and we send them a separate mail about the rules of the uh, forum to make sure that they're not recruiting people for their studies or doing market research Anything that they want to do like that, they need to come to us for permission. And so you'll occasionally see posts get taken down because they violate our terms of service. And uh, we're constantly discussing sort of what's fair, what's right, what's the what's the right way to engage the community. Um, Can I ask well, a quick question? Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so this might be out of the scope, but let's say, for instance, that I have you know, an x-ray of a knee of an adult. Um, and then I have another one, you know, three years later, and I want to compare that and make a statement on that. Is that beyond the scope of something for this kind of forum? And how would that be submitted? Well, so you, you can upload images and whatnot. I would, um, I would say several things, and these are all in our terms. One is, you know, if you are not de-identifying those things, you know, you're you're choosing to be um, public, privately public uh, within the, the context of the forum. Um, and so you're choosing to be um, identified at, at some level. And so many of those x-rays, if you don't like um, sort of scrub them there and anonymize them, you know, they'll have names and, and identifiers. So you want to be cautious of that. The second thing that we note is we're fine if people share their experiences, um, but we're really cautious with anything that's either uh, diagnosis or recommendations um, because, you know, we've got clinicians and, and the clinicians can't, you know, generally can't make recommendations either that they've got to say, here's the evidence for something. Um, they can say, this is what I do in my practice. There's not evidence for this. And this is why, but they can't make rec they can't make any give any medical advice. And so, what we really just want to make sure is that, like, if you want to do that because you're like, hey, has anybody else seen this kind of deterioration of their knee from doing this kind of you know movement? You know, that's totally fine. I just wanted to give you you know give you those caveats. Right. No, it wouldn't be diagnosis. It would be more. Um... Yeah, it wouldn't be diagnosis at all. Um, no. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm just wondering if those things could be uploaded. Um, yeah, there's no, there's no, you're not prevented from uploading images. People upload images, links. Um, yeah, that's all, all fair. And we moderate. If something's not appropriate, we take it down um, and, you know, let, let the person know. Um, you know, we've had some people that, have some experience, um, but they're really kind of coming across about as about something that in an authoritative way for which there's there's no published evidence. And we, we let people know, like we take it down and we say, you know, we're so focused on making sure that people are getting evidence-based care that what we don't want is people misunderstanding from what your credentials look like and maybe trying something. We're very cautious about that. Um, yeah, it's, it's more something but, I would by you first and then put up and, and that's totally fine we're we're you can always reach out to us to say hey is this is this a legit way to use the form yeah so oh, go ahead oh christine i just wanted to add 
to me, that's one of the advantages of engaging on a regular basis with one of the quality improvement teams. Because when you're meeting with our clinicians and other community people on a regular basis, focused on a particular research issue, we do sometimes get into discussions about diagnostic techniques and prognostications and even specific medications that we would never open to the entire group, uh, to the wider community. But, but I have found that, that by being involved directly with one of the QI groups, um, I've, I've been able to explore some specificity of interventions that I might not have been able to explore uh, through the broader platform. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Duncan. Okay, um, moving along. Uh, so I wanna give an example of specifically uh, how we treat these topics of evidence behind clinical treatments and whatnot. So I'm just gonna give a couple of examples. People have, um, that have been on the forum a fair amount see me do this. We have people that ask questions. So um, somebody asked the question, they're, they're considering having their pump removed, their ITB pump, and they wanted to know, um, you know, is that standard practice and whatnot? And, you know, we always encourage people to get feedback from their neurosurgeon or whatnot, but we also are generating evidence in this um, case. And so what I will do is I will tag, um, you know, so at Robert Bolo, who is the CPRN investigator who leads our, uh, our intrathecal baclofen pump research effort or quality improvement effort and say, I reach out to them and say, hey, Dr. Bolo, could you uh, could you comment here? And they, they all know the rules. And, uh, and, you know, you get an answer that is sort of, you might be able to find an answer like this on Google, but this is sort of very tailored to a person asked a very specific question. And, uh, you know, he's saying, you know, here are, the, here are the risks, here's how we do it, um, you know, some, some considerations. Similarly, um, people asked uh, questions. We've had a bunch of discussions about um, genetics uh, and um, someone was asking um, generally about what genes are part of the panel of testing and how does it relate to the, the research. Um, and here's Dr. Michael Kruer explaining the differences between uh, whole genome sequencing and exome sequencing and what the sort of yield or the, the benefits are. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's had like, the, you, know, you don't get much better access than to someone like Michael Kruer about uh, genetic testing. Um, here's a question someone was asking about arch surgery um, and whether or not it would allow them to avoid AFOs. Freeman, Freeman Miller, Dr. Freeman Miller is retired, but still engaged and answers questions uh, almost whenever tagged. Um, he's considered uh, by many sort of the, the father of, of the sort of orthopedic view of CP. He's written a great book uh, and he's active. Like he'll, anytime, you know, I tag him, he'll take the time to give a thoughtful answer. Um, so it's just kind of an amazing bit of uh, access to expertise. And then here's a very kind of a different one. Someone was um, asking me about a, a, a specific type of suit um, that uh, the people marketing it were quoting research that showed its improvement. And they were asking me like, why don't we have this in the US and, and whatnot? And, so what I did was I reached out to one of our, you know, uh, very well-funded NIH uh, researchers and said, hey, can you just take a look at the, the studies that are being quoted and what's being stated as the conclusion? And yeah, I got back a very, you know, well-reasoned 
response that you know that um, you know that this is evidence that's generated without control groups. So it's much weaker form of evidence, um, and in some cases, no binding. And so this is a clinical researcher who understands the sort of standards of research methodology, looking at a device product that is being offered and saying, you know, why this does is not appearing here is because there are some claims that are being made that are kind of um, using data more like a, uh, a drunk uses a lamppost, which is more for support than illumination. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we, we are able to do on the forum that are quite unique in addition to all of the uh, interactions that, that people have about a number of, uh, of, of topics. And um, I will just take a, a moment and just pop over to the, the forum to just sort of show you what's, what's there right now. Um, if my Zoom bar will get out of my way. Oh, I was logged out. Let me refresh. And notice up here that I, I talked about how MyCP is a connection of a set of services. The forum is actually running on a service that, so it says my cerebral palsy uh, uh, discourse hosting.net. Discourse is that is the name of the forum platform. Um, and so, you know, you can see there's a number of dialogues going on here. People can choose to represent themselves either as a letter, which is the, the first initial of their username, or they can actually put their picture in if they want to be, um, if they're comfortable with that. Uh, and you can see, you know, how many people are interacting, what's the, um, you know, the, the um, time that something, since something's been interacted with, um, you know, an interesting discussion that got a lot of traffic about feeling uh, isolated. And then this is just the sort of the recency view. Um, you can also go and, and use our categories to look at specific things. And so this is a little bit more like looking at the uh, table of contents to sort of figure out. So if you want to look at things where people are talking specifically about the um, community experience, um, or at least that's what they've tagged their, their, uh, their comments to be. Okay, so how can you contribute your personal data to improve outcomes for everyone? You know, really cornerstone aspect of my CP and um, how you can make a difference by contributing. So it's only for adults with CP or parents of minors with CP. This is actually a change since we moved from the University of Utah to the University of Pittsburgh, their uh, sort of regulatory review of what we were doing. Um, they felt like uh, we were having people fill in surveys um, for parents of adults um, and for caregivers of adults or children, but not legally authorized representatives. So we've restricted it now. So it's only for adults with CP and parents of minors with CP. And we're just now creating a process that, like my son who's in my CP and has been documented, just turned 18. And so we're gonna generate a mechanism by which the system automatically reaches out to the parent and says, so you no longer have access to research on behalf of your, your child, uh, your adult child. If you want, they can continue filling out the surveys and they just need to sign up for an account. It'll give a, a, a mechanism. So we preserve the data and it can be transferred. But those are the only two audiences for now that we're able to do uh, research with in the community registry. Uh, it is informed consent, uh, unlike the way we do the clinical registry, which is uh, under a waiver of consent. Uh, so the way the data is collected in uh, the clinical registry is it's de-identified. Um, your none of your name, your name or any identifiers or medical uh, record numbers are part of that uh, data set, and so the regulatory bodies um, allow us to collect that data on the whole population, um, since it can't be reverse engineered to you. Um, and uh, informed consent means you go through a, a consent process that explains to you in sort of long form um, 
It explains to you the purpose of the study, uh, what are the risks, what are the benefits, if any, uh, that your participation is voluntary, uh, and things such as that. Uh, after you do that, you're presented with uh, either a single survey on a, on a subject or uh, an initial survey for something that is a, a longitudinal survey, something where you're going to get asked every year. Uh, and uh, we use the information you give us on that onboarding, just like we did for the recommendation engine. We use this to determine whether or not you fit the mold of what the researcher is trying to answer. Um, so, you know, uh, wheelchair users are not given surveys about uh, ambulation or falls. Um, and I know there's a transfer fall issue and we, we discussed that in that uh, particular webinar. Or, um, you know, parents are not given surveys that are about adults. So we use the information you give us to tailor uh, what gets um, sent to you. And then once a new survey lands in, you get an email reminder and surveys have like a window that they're alive for. So a new survey, you might get uh, three to five reminders over a you know four to six week period. Annual surveys, there's a three month window, uh, one month on, on either side of the month in which you took the, the initial survey where you can fill in the annual survey. And if you miss that, then you know we, we wait till the next year just to make sure that the, the data has a, an appropriate amount of spacing. So surveys can be accessed via the web, via email and the web uh, or through mobile. So, you know, sort of the first point of entry is if you're in my CP and this is my, my main account um, and it offers me based on who I am, a set of, uh, a set of surveys. Um, and, you know, if you just click on the click here to fill in, uh, you get another one of these other services that are tied together. You get a survey that's actually hosted in REDCap, which is a survey engine like SurveyMonkey, but it's meant for research. And it's hosted at the University of Pittsburgh on their secure servers. Uh, and so that's sort of the first way people very often get it. But then after that, there are reminder emails. And you've probably all gotten a, an email from me. This is actually not me typing it out to you. It's automatically generated uh, and says, you know, there's a new survey available, or it says you didn't complete a survey if you did a partial completion. And if you click on the link, it'll direct you to the survey that uh, there's an opportunity to complete. So you don't have to, you don't have to go to the website uh, at first to get to that. Uh, but additionally, this all works in a mobile environment. So uh, the back shot here is just this web page rendered on a on an iPhone. And then if you click on uh, one of the surveys, this is the you know, medical history general survey rendered on an, on an iPhone from, from RedCat. So you really can participate uh, in whatever way suits you. Um, and so who is here? Um, well, as you can see, we have 2410 as of the time I made this slide, uh, either last night or earlier today. It's already above that. Um, and of those, 1,924 are from the CP community directly, whereas these other numbers represent people that are either advocates or clinicians or um, researchers or people from industry. Um, within this 1,924, you see the division of, uh, of people and only this uh, 1,817, uh, which is the total of these two, are the ones that can participate in research. Um, so that's who's there. You saw some other minor demographic information earlier. So why you should participate in these surveys is your, your contribution drives discovery. Um, today, we've only had one publication out of the, uh, out of the community registry, which has been running for a couple of years. Uh, many of you uh, participated in this, and this was Buma Ravamuthan's uh, Diagnostic Preferences uh, survey. Uh, and the registry really helped answer that um, survey very quickly. Um, but we have 
numerous other publications that are underway, uh, speech and language uh, predictors of participation, the sensory study that was presented recently is being written up, uh, a preliminary study of adult pain and adult function is being written by uh, Mary Gennati and uh, Christina um, Sarmiento. Uh, the consequences of fall, a fall study that was uh, completed last summer and uh, presented a, a few months ago. Those are all under uh, development. And so what that does is publications are the first step to changing practice. This generalizes the knowledge and then we can take that knowledge and work it into changing the way care is done. The last part is the ability to participate in uh, a really marvelous uh, wellness program that's been developed by the folks at the University of Alabama uh, at the National Center for Health, Physical Activity uh, and Disability. Uh, and it's called MENTOR. And what MENTOR stands for is mindfulness. And so it teaches the basics of meditation and what are the benefits of it. Uh, exercise, and it provides free equipment and adapted personalized training uh, for getting an appropriate amount of uh, cardio and strengthening. Uh, it provides um, uh, teaching on nutrition, as well as you know, specific one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching is available for meal prep to really uh, take care of your, um, your metabolic health, your gut health. And then the mentor, the TOR stands to optimize uh, resilience. And it's really intended to develop skills that can be uh, carried forward and not just a one-off uh, one experience. And so it's a free virtual course. It's offered by the CP Research Network in collaboration with the University of Alabama. And it's eight weeks long. It's one hour a day for, uh, uh, for the five weekdays. Um, it is... Uh, it is runs on a, with people that are on central time. So if you're on the East Coast, you probably, if you work full time and you're on the East Coast, you can do it. Um, if you're on the, uh, not on the East Coast, it is a challenge if you work full time to be able to uh, be able to do the class unless you have a flexible work environment where you can take an hour during, uh, during the day to do a class like this. So what's next? More studies, uh, you're just gonna see studies coming, uh, getting loaded in, you'll get notifications if you're a member already, more publications. Uh, we hope to develop a number of interactive tools that we believe that because of the information you give us, and because of the tools that a number of our investigators are generating, we can do things like take hip surveillance and guide you. We can say, we know the age of your child, we know the GMFCS, so that drives a surveillance schedule and we can prompt you and then you can go and get the surveillance done. You get back one really key data point about that, which is the migration percentage of your child's hips. And we can let you know when that reaches a point that you should take action if, if necessary or it's stabilized and uh, no further surveillance is, is considered necessary. Uh, Goal and CP Child, which uh, Dr. Lena Ryan has discussed, um, really uh, give a, a mechanism for uh, doing shared decision making. And so we have a version of these that we've worked on implementing that you take this survey that's part of the registry now, and it can produce a summary that can be used in a discussion with your clinician about improving your experience with, with CP. Likewise, uh, Dr. Narayan has uh, developed CP checklist, which is really for managing complex CP. And we plan to make that a tool. Uh, and some of our investigators are working on some family diagnostic tools that can really uh, help um, families identify issues with their uh, children. And then we're also working on some clinical trial referral capabilities. So right now we refer sort of internally, but as we, um, we are looking at ways in which we can refer to trials in general based on the information we know about you. So um, in summary, uh, MyCP is a free personalized web portal. And it, as you saw, sits in CPRN, but gives you access to a number of other resources that are connected to CPRN for those discussions, for those personalized web resources. But really the most um, important part is for you to be able to contribute to the body of research so we can advance 
the research into CP uh, and access to our program. So I know most of you are signed up, um, but I want to open it up to questions. Um, not that we haven't answered questions as we go, but um, let me let me see if anybody has any specific questions um, from that. Let me take a, I'll take a look in the. Um, so um, I don't know if that's Poonam or Jay uh, asked, is there, um, uh, is CPRN going to do another round of research ideas uh, from the CP community? So we're still working fervently on the two rounds we've done, but there are two audiences we're very aware of that we are missing um, or we don't feel are fully represented in the work we've done. One audience is teens and young adults. And so we did have some parents of some uh, teens as part of Research CP, but we believe that that's an audience we'd really love to engage. And we, we need to give some thought because, um, you know, being in my, uh, in my 60s, like I do not TikTok and I only Snapchat with my daughter. And so reaching the teens, uh, that's, that's a challenge that we probably need someone to join us that is passionate about uh, reaching that audience in a way that's effective. Um, and then the other is we feel like our research CP is a little stilted towards ambulators. And uh, we feel like there's really um, some prioritization around the research questions for people that are non-ambulators is, is really important. So we wanna do those. We have to put some time between ours just because of our resources and whatnot, but we think, um, uh, but we think that's an important area. So, um, so Poonam, if you want to get, if Jay wants to be engaged in that, I would welcome his involvement. Uh, go ahead, uh, Chris. What's up? Um, when you're using Epic and getting data on people, uh, you know that it's gearing it toward, you know, do you have CP? Um, but for instance, if a person has CP and then you're also getting a marker that that person has an inflammatory condition or that they have a gastrointestinal issue or any other kind of issue, um, are you also able to go to that, um, you know, like if you're getting a whole bunch of things that say, hey, we have a lot of people with gastrointestinal issues, can you then, um, you know, begin research on that area and focus there instead of just cerebral palsy to be able to pull in, oh, wow, you know, now we have to research gastrointestinal issues over the lifetime and we'll recognize that that's a contributing. Um, can we communicate those things? Because if yes. we go backwards, then I would, for instance, be able to say, hey, you know, everybody from 60 down needs to look at this. So how would we do that? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. I'm going to do a little screen share. This is going to be a little technical, but I think, um, I think people will get value out of this and understand where I'm going. Um, so we get information from two sources. Um, they both come from the EMR, but um, Deb Grenard is on this call, and she is a clinical research coordinator at Seattle Children's, and she actually looks up patients that have a diagnosis of CP, and then she fills in these forms that we have uh, that give us very specific information about their CP specifically, and that provides a lot of very valuable and rich data. But the other way we get data, and this is really where we intend to go in the long run, is to get data directly from Epic or Cerner. And so what this table is here is the format that we use. This is a, it's not fair to quite call it an industry standard, but there's uh, hundreds of millions of rows of data that are formatted in these tables. So each one of these gray labels is a table in a database definition. And then the other lines are, are, they're called keys, but they're pieces of data that are in that. There's many more um, other pieces of, of data. So when we get that, so Nationwide sends us all of their encounters, all of the diagnoses, all of the procedures, all of the conditions that have been defined, all of the lab results, 
all of the uh, prescribing that's been done, um, and then any clinical observations, uh, in addition to all those things that Deb Grenard pulls about uh, CP, um, those things that we get to CP specific. So we're building this very, very large database. And as investigators find these correlations and see you know, opportunities, this is part of what was done by Adam Ostendorf and CP, we, I'm sorry, and epilepsy, we added a set of questions about epilepsy and it allowed us to see unique things about the treatments that people with epilepsy and CP don't get. Um, so we're getting a very rich set of data um, from the EMR polls and, and more sites are sending us data uh, via the EMR over time. Um, and so it's really uh, super valuable to what we can solve in, in, topic, in areas like that. So great question. How are, how are you able to weed out the fact that, you know, for instance, I know that, you know, we have 10 minute doctor appointments. And one of the problems with CP is that, you know, you're going through your history and they're coding, you know, 15 things you have, but they're only dealing with two, but 15 things get listed. So that's like one of the most common things I hear. I don't get an opportunity to get to the things I really need to deal with. So if I was doing a survey with people, I would go, okay, how do we get physicians or people to hone in on what's necessary? What could be done as a researcher to highlight what's actually dealt with on that day? Because often we have data that's just repeated, but not actually dealt with in that vision. Is, yeah. that, is that damaging our data sets? Well, I, I don't know that it damages our data sets, but it's certainly an opportunity um, I mean, I think part of it is our medical system and and how it works. Um, but we would have we would have data that says, here's the problem list, and here are the two things that we had encounters about. And so we could uh, basically, someone interested in answering this question could query in a way to determine, you know, what are the unaddressed problems in a set of CP visits, as an example. So the data is there, um, but not all of the data because those the data that's around those issues, if the patient doesn't go and see a doctor that's a specialist in that area, you know, we won't end up having that other encounter and observation data. Thank you. Go ahead, Duncan. Uh, I want to circle back to June's uh, uh, two questions that June has raised over time. One is being answered tonight, and she asked that uh, we consider uh, web meetings that might extend beyond one hour to ensure greater discussion. And that let is me, happening tonight. Let me let me give you a timeout on that. I just now looked at the clock for the first time, and I want to say to everyone, I'm going to stay on, and you're all welcome to stay on for another uh, 15 minutes, probably. But I want to say. Thank you to everyone that uh, tuned in tonight. Thank you for the feedback. It's uh, super valuable. Thanks for spending time on uh, CPRN and my CP and contributing. It's all it's all being put to good use, and we look forward to find more ways to get you uh, engaged. So feel free to sign off. This will be recorded and posted. Um, but go ahead, uh, Duncan. To your point, and, and I think the second one is and. And perhaps you and Michelle could organize um, a session like this where we would just focus on strategies for expanding, recruiting, outreaching uh, to build our community registries. I did share tonight with, oh, maybe a half dozen to a dozen longtime friends of mine who have CP, and I'm disappointed that none of them are on here tonight. But I do think we need to have some kind of organized uh, discussion about specific strategies uh, to, to outreach and recruit more community registry members and although 
I know the vast majority of you, we are disgustingly white middle class college educated, and we have got to find some way uh, to get into uh, minority communities um, and and get their perspective and to get those primary consumers and families more involved in the registry. And that's a whole that's a whole different area uh, that I think um, those of us on this call tonight could make some real valuable contributions uh, personally and experientially on how we could um, expand our reach. Um, so let me address those in reverse order. So on recruitment, I think it's a great idea and I would love to get together people um, Mary and, and uh, Mary Gennady and Ed Herbitz would be very interested in that as well um, to talk about how we can do additional recruitment. Um, uh, and I, I think I may have just sort of struck a, a minor uh, gold mine with the uh, photo contest, but I'll come back to that um, in, in a moment. Um, what we have done is Mary went out and got both a, an industry grant and wrote a um, a research grant with the APTA and got funding. And so we've gotten about $35,000 worth of funding uh, to increase re recruitment, um, in particular for the adult study, which is embedded in the community registry, where the bias is we have predominantly, you know, middle-class white women, GMFCS2. And so, you know, we really want to round out um, the, the, the sample that we're getting to get more generalizable information. So we started out, we partnered with the CP Foundation and um, they've done a recruitment effort for us uh, and they've been able to recruit about a hundred additional um, people. They were able to get a little bit better mix of, um, of GMFCS three and four, uh, a little bit better mix of, of men, um, but still, you know, their, their bias is similar to our, our bias. Uh, the other things we plan to do is that Ed Hurwitz is going to use his clinic to try to recruit people directly, either in real time there. Um, and that gives us an opportunity to, you know, reach people that are kind of a little bit of a captive audience and, um, you know, try to intentionally get a different sampling. The third thing is I'm taking the remaining funds um, from uh, those grants that I have access to, uh, and I am, uh, and then some funding I got from Google, and I'm trying to see that between Facebook and Google, can I figure out how to target the audience we need to get them to take the study? Um, and so that's just not insubstantial amount of money that we have. We actually have $10,000 a month from Google to spend on advertising, but it's kind of hard to figure out how to get, you know, from being able to advertise on Google to getting people through to taking the study. But we're going to, we're working on that. And so that's a very active uh, item uh, that we have. And um, I think the gold mine that I was going to refer to is uh, the photo contest won uh, a couple staff members reached out from a, a neuromuscular adult home um, and got a number of their people to participate in our photo contest. And we're having a follow-up meeting next week to talk about other ways they could be involved because they found that really valuable. Um, and it was great for awareness. Uh, we had a couple of winners from uh, that um, place because they did a great job raising awareness. So I think there are other strategies and I think tapping into your collective brain trust would uh, be help would be helpful. Uh, longer Thanks. webinars, I, I think we just have a time constraint that, you know, we polled everybody and it's like, if you want to get people on the West Coast, you can't really start before five. And if you've got, it's really hard to get people, I think it's figuring out what discussions we need to do and we can do earlier, or maybe we can do pre-recorded and have the time be discussion time or something like that. We, we can try, it's a good idea to try additional things. June, what can I do for you? 
Yeah, a couple of things. One is, yeah, we had to participate in that in a brainstorm kind of session that you all talked about. Um, the surveys, I know um, when I get a prompt to do a survey, I start it, you know, but I'm busy. It, it shows up in a hundred different emails. So I did not know that it's, it's time sensitive. So you might want to consider in the subject line saying 30 day opportunity or 60 day opportunity because I think you already have all the time in the world to do them. I did not know they were time, time sensitive. So just a note on that. That's a great idea. And I'm sure uh, Blair Cooper, who's a programmer that helps me do all the fancy things that happen would probably, uh, would he would groove on getting that done. I think that's great. And also um, you mentioned really quick in passing that you would not want to uh, do a, uh, a fall survey, send a fall survey to wheelchair users, unless it was about transferring, but there are many wheelchair and scooter users who are walkers as well. So just, I know it kind it's of great. dices, but just just take note. No, it's a great point. And, and as Duncan could tell you, so we're having a marvelous discussion in the adult, uh, in the adult care, um, about the change, what's the right way to treat GMFCS for um, for adults? Because you know the the definition goes up to eighteen. It still gets used after that. But we've been having a lot of discussion as to the sort of range uh, that people, the dynamic range of GMFCS for an adult in a given day, and that sometimes the scooter is the go-to thing, and sometimes uh, a power chair is a go-to thing. Then sometimes it's a walker. Sometimes it's, you know, it's canes uh, or, or crutches, and sometimes it's, you know, it's nothing. And so we've been talking about how to deal with that. But it's a very good point that the GMFCS, especially in the older population, um, might be too limiting for how we um, put that out. The key thing I was trying to emphasize there is it was really made clear to us that. People, um, in particular, it was made clear by parents, but I think it's probably general. People that had kids that were not ambulators getting a survey that was all about, you know, their participation in sports where they had to ambulate or something like that. It was, it was just like, it was disappointing. It's like, you know, um, hey, could you not like figure out which ones to share with me? No, no, that makes a lot of sense. But your issue about GMFC and older people, you know, like uh, Duncan, I would love to participate in that kind of discussion, a small discussion with you to talk about the nuances and the complexities of that question. Okay, that's great. I think that's, uh, I think we definitely would like to expand that. So that, that makes sense. I'm gonna take a moment and read, I read like a snail what Jay uh, Pandy said, so hold on. Yes, I think that's a great. Uh, I think that's a great point, uh, Jay. And and one of the things. So Jay's. Yeah, anybody can read Jay's comment in the uh, text. It's like um, you know, focusing. If we want to do like a uh, engage people, focus on the things that they want to accomplish. And uh, we had some very good feedback from someone that like they really would have liked to have known a little earlier how they should direct their education from careers that they would be more accessible to them if say they're a wheelchair user or, or something like that. And to make sure that they sort of spend their time educationally in a way that is sort of wise for their opportunities and, and fits. But that the whole general topic I think is a, is a great point. Um, and I probably still like, you know, I'm, I have an 18 year old son and I still have not figured out the magic trick to get him to in, engage, even if it relates to that kind of thing. So um, off to music production, he goes. Um, anyway, any, um, any final uh, questions? The one, the one last thought I have, Paul, is 
the forum is wonderful, but I'm looking at who's on the any of us serial participants. You do have a core, you do have a core group of us. And I would like to explore the possibility of some type of listserv with informed consent. Because as you know, and Michelle know, I share all kinds of stuff with you two and with Paul Perlmutter and, and uh, Jocelyn Cohen at the Alliance and with UCP that I wouldn't necessarily post on the forum, like the recent research on the impact of COVID uh, during pregnancy and the uptake on, on uh, neurodevelopmental disabilities that are coming out of those things. I wouldn't post those on the, the forum, but I think if we had this, huh? as you call it, your choir, maybe a, 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 a more intimate listener group so let me just ask a question, um, Duncan. Why wouldn't you? Do you feel like it's not intimate enough? What's your concern? Because that's really what the forum, like Susan Paserno recently said, hey, let's let's like post things that are like, you know, just good news for people with CP. And she posted the kid that got into Harvard and that reaction and whatnot. And we're totally like, it is a built-in listserv and I love to not create another thing. I can create a group within there to say, hey, if you want traffic about just other things, but I would be inclined to just post it into like start a, start a thread that's on either just that topic or a set of topics. I can create a category that you can tag it and then people can subscribe to the category or not. That's probably the, like, we've got all the infrastructure there. I'd love to get you through whatever your concern is there. And, and I guess, I guess more specifically is that I would, maybe I'm an outlier, but I probably deal with 50 to 70 emails a day from United Cerebral Palsy, the Disability Independent Living Network, the State Independent Living Council, the DNR Accessible Advisory Council, the, uh, the Alliance CPRN. And quite frankly, if I took even half of those and took time to load them to the forum, I'd run out of time. Hey, uh, Duncan, I just want to add to what you said and what Jay's uh, chat post is. You know, Paul, um, it would be great to, I'm overwhelmed with all the email too. I can't stay, I'm just buried. But wouldn't it be fun to do some webinars like, you know, older folks with CP uh, reflecting on younger folks on webinar. If I knew then what I know now, just kind of fun, pass you along things that where you don't need to write another friggin' email or post but you just have kind of a, a dialogue or a little webinar. That would be great fun, I think. <laughs> really quickly, I think, I think I, if you don't mind, I think what's really important is that we should all understand that discernment is important. It's great to share narrative, but what we need to do is we need to listen as Panda said here, about what is needed from everyone and you know it's great to share a million emails but sometimes those are learning opportunities and is this for research is this what is the purpose of what we're sharing and then wait for a response and let it build from there i i think there's a way to accommodate each of these different needs and that's why the sort of the notification engine is so important so you can just you know, emails overloaded and, and, you know, we do about four blog posts a month and, you know, that can just be, it can just like up noise from CPRN when really what you're interested in is like, is there any adult research that's happened recently? Or, you know, are you doing a, you know, an X um, or whatever? Um, so I think 
I think more discussion about this, more ways to engage, more ways that people can engage in the way they want without being overloaded. Like June, the idea you're talking about sounds like it could be a lot of fun. We could uh, we could think about the best way to do that. Um, let me circle up with Michelle and talk about some of this. And uh, Duncan, we can talk more about um, a way to make it not so burdensome, but that people could have access to that fire hose of information. And you know, they, you can listen if you want. You know, it's like you know, it's like Reddit. If you want to dive in, there's as much to read as you could ever want. Um, so, all right, I need to wrap up. Um, it was a pleasure speaking with you all. Thanks for staying engaged for so long. I hope you found it useful and you learned some new things about MyCP, but I appreciate everything that everyone's giving to the platform and trying to move uh, uh, move things forward with um, uh, cerebral palsy care and outcomes. So thank you all. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Take care, everyone.